Chapter 7. Stolen Comic Books When Bradley gave up on becoming an astronaut, school became boring again. He started making B's and C's like he used to, and tried to imagine being a welder or repairing TVs, but neither interested in him. He thought about becoming a boxer, like the ones his father watched on TV. The idea of hitting something felt good. He tried punching the couch when nobody was looking, but the padding was worn and cheap and it hurt his hand. One day a kid at school named Jerry was handing out candy. He looked like he was begging for attention and it worked. Bradley ran over and got one. I know how to get all the candy I want and other things too. Does anybody want to go with me? Said Jerry. Bradley had ripped the wrapper off a nickel Hershey bar, broken a couple of squares off and stuck them in his mouth. I'll go with you to steal something, he said. The creamy, delicious chocolate filled his mouth and made him slur the words. Don't say steal, said Jerry. You'll get in trouble. Then how did you get this stuff, said Bradley. He was looking at Jerry's worn-out clothes, hand-me-downs like his own. Only rich kids could give away candy, and Jerry wasn't rich. Don't tell a lie, thought Bradley. Jerry pulled Bradley aside. Okay, I know a place where we can get free candy and other stuff. Easy. If we both go, I can keep the cashier busy, and you can get some magazines too, a Playboy. Bradley thought about Mo going to jail for stealing. He decided nobody would care about a kid stealing candy, and they would never put a 10-year-old in jail anyway. After school, they went over the plan. You walk in with your book bag over one shoulder, go buy the magazines and grab a Playboy, then put it in your bag. Don't stop. Keep walking and just get out of the store. I'll be up front looking at the candy and making sure the guy isn't watching you. I have to grab a Playboy? Why do you need a Playboy? Asked Bradley. As a 10-year-old boy, he didn't know much about male urges. Jerry was ahead of him in that arena. The closest he'd come were his feelings for Miss Finchbow. I've been to that store a lot and they will watch me. You're innocent. And just wait till you see the fold out of the Playmate of the month. Then you'll know why I need it. You're getting the candy, right? I'd like another Hershey bar said Bradley. Of course, dude. I got that covered, said Jerry. It sounded easy, and Bradley was excited when he met Jerry that Saturday after lunch at Thrifty's on Colorado Boulevard. It was a bright sunny day, and there was lots of traffic. People were walking around everywhere, and nobody seemed to notice them. Jerry put his bike in an alley around the corner where it wouldn't get stolen, and he could make a quick getaway. Bradley followed him into the store, his bag slung over his left shoulder. He closed in on the magazine rack. Over his other shoulder, he saw Jerry head to the candy bins below the edge of the checkout counter. Bradley imagined grabbing the Playboy with his right hand and stuffing it in the bag like he had pictured a hundred times. His mouth went dry and his knees felt like rubber. He turned back to the rack. Two men were looking at the magazines. Bradley would have to go between them and reach up above his head to get the Playboy. He turned around and walked back out of the store, feeling sweaty and prickly all over, and waited for Jerry by his bike. Jerry stormed out on Bradley's heels, eyes narrowed in anger. What happened? You didn't even try. Two men were there. They would have caught me. They don't give a shit. They probably would have cheered you on. Jerry's face was twisted, his voice loud enough to get someone's attention. Nah, let's do something else. Bradley wanted to make it up to Jerry. They'd gotten along great until now. Bradley had forgotten about the candy, but Jerry pulled out a few pieces of sour candy that made him wince when the bitter taste spread over his tongue. I know. Let's go start a fire, Jerry said with a big grin. He wasn't mad anymore. The terrifying scene of the Apollo astronauts burning alive in their command module came to Bradley. No way. Jerry, I gotta go and take care of some stuff. See you later. Bradley turned and ran across the street towards home, arriving just before dark. Mo was there and they were finishing chili dogs from Pup and Taco. Natalie had saved one for him as well as a few french fries. God damn it. Where were you? You're not supposed to take off for hours without telling me, she said, doing her best impression of a normal mom. Bradley looked down at his sneakers and turned his toes in. I was playing with Jerry. Mo, who had been shoveling big bites of food into his mouth, looked mad about something, but didn't speak. He stood and went to the sink in one giant step, dropping the bowl with a clatter before strutting into the front room. Bradley could hear him twist open the cap on a bottle and click the TV on. Well, I'm glad Jerry gave you permission to come home for dinner. Sit down and eat, mister, his mom said, her voice angry. 
Bradley could tell there was a problem between his parents that was much worse than two kids trying to steal a playboy. He obeyed and took a bite of the cold chili dog. It was nasty and had white flecks of grease congealed around the chili. The fries were limp and too salty. The flavors mixed with the smell of a stinky ashtray overflowing with cigarette butts. He started to feel sick and pushed the ashtray away, which caused Natalie to snatch it and dump the whole thing in the garbage. Then she started washing dishes, banging things, and breathing hard. While Bradley had been hanging around with Jerry, his parents were at each other's throats. Mo had lost his job again, and Natalie had told him he couldn't stay in the house unless he was bringing some money home. He had threatened to break her jaw if she didn't shut the hell up and give him another chance. After dinner, Mo stretched out, working up courage with the help of a bottle of Jack Daniels to make a big play that would solve their money problems for a good while. It was the kind of play he had sworn to Natalie on his dead father's grave that he would never do again. He was big on swearing on his old man's grave and forgetting it right after he said it. Shu came over, and the two went out to a bar down the street to discuss business. Bradley saw Jerry at recess a couple weeks later. Hey, man, how about we steal that playboy? He wanted to make up for his failure. Really? You got a cool bike too, huh? I saw you riding at a Schwinn Stingray. Lucky you. Yeah, my dad got a bonus at work and brought everyone presents. My mom got a new stove. She was so happy. My little brother got a chess set. Can you believe it? Six years old and he wanted a chess set. No, I never heard of that. Jerry laughed his guts out. Then they made a plan to meet at Thrifty's on Saturday afternoon. Why another Saturday? The same guy will be there. He'll recognize us, Bradley said. Jerry assured him they wouldn't get caught. The old man limped with a cane and could barely read without glasses, let alone spot them stealing. They showed up as planned, both on bikes, which they hid in the alley behind a dumpster. It went like clockwork. A few people were there in the store. The old man was busy at the register and no one was in front of the magazine rack. Bradley walked down the aisle and grabbed the Playboy, helping himself to a couple of Marvel comic books too. Then he ducked out of the store with the stolen magazines, shifted his bag onto both shoulders and sped away. He didn't wait for Jerry. He figured his older friend was just keeping the clerk distracted. They were going to meet up later at the vacant lot to divvy up the loot. But when Bradley got there, Jerry was nowhere to be seen. After two hours by the oak tree, Bradley went home. Jerry didn't come to school on Monday or Tuesday. Bradley went over to his house and knocked until a woman answered the door in a long bathrobe. Jerry's mother. Jerry didn't come to school, Bradley said. They pulled him out of school, honey, she said. The words came slowly, her voice thick and low. He got caught stealing out of that drugstore twice now. I had to sign papers for him to go to the reform school in El Monte. Oh, no, that's all Bradley could say. He pretended he didn't know anything. Is he home? Bradley wanted to give Jerry the playboy. Oh, honey, she said, her voice suddenly gravelly. They took him away and put him in a foster home. She bowed her head. They tried to tell me I wasn't a good mother to him. Tears came on her cheeks and she shuddered. Bradley felt an awful ache in his belly. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've got to go. Bradley said at last. He turned away, got on his bike, and hurried home. For a long time, Bradley had nightmares of getting caught with the stolen items. Poor Jerry never got to see the Playboy. Bradley looked at the centerfold and imagined Jerry would say she was beautiful, but he didn't feel anything special. He put the magazine under a flat rock by the old oak tree in the vacant lot two blocks from their house. He hoped Jerry would get it someday. He kept the comic books hidden under his mattress. Of all the superheroes, his favorite was Superman. It wasn't because he had the most superpowers, which he did, and not because he was the smartest, which he was. It wasn't even that he had the most girlfriends or that he had a cool disguise as a reporter for a newspaper. What was the most inspiring about Superman was that he was from another planet. Bradley loved the story of baby Kal-El, who was born on the planet Krypton and blasted off in a rocket to Earth, where he got special powers from the atmosphere. The idea that someone who looked like a human could be from another planet excited him. Maybe I'm from somewhere else and not the Earth. He wondered who he could talk to about it. Then he remembered his mom telling him she was afraid he was going to be crazy like Grandma Mary. He put that thought away. Another thing he liked about Superman, one that no one would think was crazy, was his destiny to help people on Earth. 
That had such an impact on Bradley that he started spending his days imagining what it would be like to be him. He dreamed about running faster than a locomotive, leaping higher than a tall building, or flying like a bird or a plane. He liked the stories about terrible villains that always ended up losing. Superman could make things right. Bradley knew Superman wasn't real. The astronauts were the only ones who came close. Real men were more like Uncle Bob, who would come from Texas every year and give a silver dollar to each kid. The Rosedale boys had never seen anybody who could show off a handful of shiny silver dollars, let alone hand them out like candy. But Uncle Bob was fat and bald and worked at a bank. Mo always made fun of him, calling Uncle Bob old white shoes behind his back. Superman could only help people and never hurt them. Bradley got hope again and stopped feeling so bored and uninspired. He was going to stay busy and work hard all the time to be more like Superman. Put up your dukes, kid, Mo called out at him one morning before school. His father would joke around like that when he was sober. Bradley had gotten bigger and threw a hard punch and landed squarely on Mo's chest. Thump! Went his ribcage. Bradley worried he'd hurt him. Ow, you little son of a... Mo snapped, more surprised than hurt. He countered by throwing a flurry of little slaps to Bradley's head and shoulders and followed through by stepping in low with a left uppercut to his son's ribs. None of the blows were meant to hurt. He was just fooling around. But it was hard for him to hold back all the way. God damn it, Morris! Natalie had heard the commotion. She knew how her run-amuck husband could get rough, even when he was playing. Bradley was on the floor, holding his chest, his face red from getting slapped. He breathed hard through the pain, refusing to cry. I'm sorry, son. Just take that as a little lesson. Get yourself toughened up. Mo bent down and pulled the boy onto his feet. Bradley shook it off with a fake smile. That was nothing, Dad. He spit the words out despite the ripping ache in his belly, surprising everyone by how tough he sounded. Natalie had a little lunch sack for him. He dropped it in a book bag and took off for school, thinking about what had just happened. What would Superman do? He would have hit Mo a lot harder the first time, or he would have jumped away fast when Mo came at him, or he would have hit him back in the face before that punch to the ribs. He got to school, parking his bike and locking it before starting down the hall to class. On the wall was a horizontal board that could have been a chair rail. It was perfect for taking a punch. He tested it with a couple of light smacks from his fist. Yeah, time to toughen up. Like Dad said, one day I'll be throwing punches like Superman. Every time he walked the hallway, he would throw punches at the board on the wall. A left hook across his body, a right jab. Then he would walk on the other side and do the opposite. At first he tried to hide it, but when no one seemed to notice or care, he started doing it everywhere. It was amazing how no one paid any attention. Come here, honey. What's wrong with your hand? Natalie said one day as he walked through the door after school. He put it in his pocket. Nothing, he said. Let me see your hand now. He pulled it out and she looked. Oh, damn. The bigger knuckles of both hands had layers of dark scabs and were swollen. There were healing purple scars, which were getting better because he was learning to hit more squarely. The skin was thickening from the repeated trauma. What is this? What are you doing, Bradley? She almost cried. I'm toughening up like Dad said. He almost told her he wanted to be like Superman, but it made him think of getting a bar of soap shoved in his mouth. Oh, no, that's not right. Don't do that, Bradley. When Natalie told Mo, he jumped. Well, that's some good news. I think we got us a boxer, Mama. Mo took Bradley to the boys' club, where they had junior boxing tryouts. They watched some kids with gloves and headgear fight each other, throwing real punches. It didn't look that hard. Mo talked the coach into letting Bradley try it, but it took some convincing. The coach held a pad up and watched Bradley give it a few solid punches. Bradley got into the ring with a black kid about his age and height, and the kid pranced around like Cassius Clay, throwing jabs and punches between and around Bradley's upraised arms. Hitting Bradley in the face and head again and again, he had him down on his butt in a minute. The coach stopped the fight and said, bring him back when he can defend himself. Mo took the headgear off Bradley, held the boy's head in his hands, and carefully looked him over. His face was bleeding and one eye was starting to swell. The coach told Mo to take Bradley to a doctor and gave them a bag of ice. Damn, son. Your mama is going to kick my ass. Why did you hit him back? He wasn't nothing, just a skinny little punk. There was no concern for Bradley's injuries. I don't know, Dad, said Bradley. Mo put a firm hand on his shoulder and guided him out of the gym. He got in the car with his father, holding the ice bag on his face, and they drove home. Bradley found out the hard way that he didn't have it in him to hurt anybody. 
it just wasn't in his spirit, as Natalie would say. But he could still try to be like Superman. That night, he stayed up late reading a school book, mostly with one eye, because the other was almost swollen shut. Nobody bothered him. He read two chapters ahead. By the end of the school year, Bradley was making A's again and had finished the red level, which was the final color of the student reading cards. Summer came and went. Mo was in jail again, and they were about to get evicted for the third time that Bradley could remember. 